Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jonathan Lippman, uh, the former chief judge of New York, now of counsel at Latham and Watkins here in the city, and of course a uh, alumni of this great uh, law school. So today we have a panel on the role of lawyers in natural disaster recovery. Uh, we have a terrific panel who I will quickly introduce to you. To my far left is Judy Perry Martinez, who is of counsel at Simon Peregrine Smith and Redfeam in New Orleans, and the president-elect of the American Bar Association. Uh, she has served as chair of the ABA Presidential Commission on the Future of Legal Services, and recently as a member of the ABA Task Force on Building Public Trust in the American Justice System. Uh, Next to uh, Judy is Will Polk, who's the Assistant General Counsel of the North Carolina Department of Public Safety, who also serves as in-house counsel for the Division of Emergency Management and chair of the Legal Counsel Committee for the National Emergency Management Association. And to my immediate left is Monica Vigas Patan, who is Executive Director of Legal Services of Greater Miami, Inc., which provides legal assistance to Miami-Dade and Monroe County's low-income residents. She oversees a staff of more than 60 people, including 28 attorneys. Before we dive into the issues, let me quickly give you a little context. Since 2013, there have been 248 natural disaster declarations in the United States not including local declarations, that run the gamut from hurricanes to superstorms to tornadoes, wildfires, volcanic eruptions, and earthquakes. The names in the devastation should be familiar to you. Going back to Katrina in 2005, a Category 5 storm that led to the evacuation of New Orleans, 1.2 million people, with 50% of New Orleans being underwater. Katrina took 1,800 lives and had $100 billion in damages. The tornado in Joplin, Missouri in 2011, 30% of the town was destroyed in 12 minutes with 161 people dead. Superstorm Sandy, those of you who are in New Yorkers, in 2012 on the East Coast, where the storm spanned 1,000 miles with 162 people killed and 8.5 million people left without electricity. Harvey, Maria, Irma in 2017 ravished and, and caused such destruction and human misery in Texas, Florida, the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. You've seen the images again and again. The California wildfires of 2017 and 18 destroyed one million to two million acres of land and thousands of homes and obliterated the town of Paradise, California, population 27,000 in just a few hours. Hurricane Michael in October of 18, 155 mile per hour winds caused 15 billion in damages and devastating the Florida Panhandle, Georgia, the Carolinas and Virginia, and on and on. The impact on the poor of these disasters has been overwhelming. A majority of Americans are unprepared when these kinds of disasters strike, and low-income people are particularly impacted as they struggle in normal times to keep employment and affordable housing and to find ways to provide basic health care, food, and safety for themselves and their families. In the wake of these disasters, Legal issues abound for low-income Americans, including housing or things that seem so simple, such as missing crucial documents, birth certificate, driver's licenses, social security cards, or insurance problems, scams, price gouging, and dealing with government bureaucracies like FEMA and the like. And legal assistance is so necessary, whether for benefits, domestic violence prevention, consumer law or fraud. And in the trenches are our legal services organizations 
who are severely under-resourced, but yet are a lifeline to survivors. And as is, marshaling the efforts of pro bono volunteer attorneys to help the victims of these disasters. The Legal Services Corporation based in DC, the largest provider of civil legal services uh, in the country, with 133 legal service grantees in 800 offices in every state, is critical to implementing a coordinated response network for legal services and assistance. In that role, LSC established the Legal Services Corporation Disaster Task Force, which I am proud to co-chair. The purpose of the task force is to foster collaboration of the legal and emergency management communities to promote awareness of disaster preparedness and response and its importance for legal services, to build an organized infrastructure to share expertise and training, and to develop best practices and toolkits to disseminate on a local and national level. The task force is really the genesis of today's panel, where we will discuss the role of lawyers in the legal community in the overall recovery efforts and providing desperately needed legal assistance to the poor and low-income survivors of natural disasters. In the course of our work on the task force, which have and will include meetings and field hearings in DC, Texas, and Florida, we have learned so much and so many issues have surfaced. So let's start the panel with the most basic question for all of us and for all of you as lawyers to be. To be. And let me start with you, uh, Judy, particularly as the incoming president of the ABA, what is the role of lawyers in the bar in responding to the legal needs of those impacted by natural disasters? So thank you, Judge, and thanks to all of you for being here to allow us to share our stories and our perspectives on a topic that, frankly, has been one of my life stories. Um, I grew up in New Orleans, uh, born and raised, and lived in St. Bernard Parish, and in 1965, experienced my first hurricane, that was Betsy, when they had to bring milk to us in a pirog, and I lost my grandmother in that storm. Uh, fast forward through a life of hurricanes um, on and off, and then to Katrina. Um, so my perspective is one that has been colored by my life experience, just as I know when you find your passion in the law, um, you will similarly be colored by your life experiences. Um, so the role of lawyers to me and the role of the organized bar is very clear cut and simple. To contribute your time, your talents, and your energies to helping those who can't recover from storms. Um, there is undoubtable and, and indisputable, I should say, evidence about the lack of recovery of the elderly and those without resources. And I can tell you that even those with resources when faced with the calamities that something like a hurricane or a firestorm brings, um, when, you know, think about if you have a house burned down to the ground in your neighborhood, the entire neighborhood comes to the help of that family. Or maybe it's your church or synagogue that rallies to help them. But when an entire city is devastated or an area is burned to the ground, there's no one left to help. There's very few resources that are available. And that is one of the most um, significant moments when the aid of local lawyers and the national and state and local bar and affinity bars can really be, be brought to bear. Um, it is not only about the Bar Association acting, it's about individual lawyers stepping up and taking the action that they can to contribute. Their role is not only as a bar association to make sure that they are working with their court system, the regulator of lawyers who come into practice, we'll talk about that later, in assuring that access to needed legal services can be brought about even if the local population of lawyers is suffering because they too have had their homes flooded or their houses burned down, but also the individual lawyers who say, I'll take somebody come it, to come stay in my office or stay in my home or do something that I otherwise would not think of do, I can doing because then I can leverage that person getting back to where they need to be in order that they can help people who are not lawyers and help citizens who need their help most. Um, we'll be talking about this throughout the panel, but the role is to step up just like you'd step up in any other situation, knowing the oath you took, knowing your passion for the law, and having the great skills and integrity and competence that you have in order to be able to make a difference in people's lives when they need it the most. 
And you know, Julie, the, uh, when you say lawyers, every lawyer really should be stepping up. I know we had, in the recent storm that hit Texas, uh, at Latham, we had to give part of our office space to the local legal services organization because it was literally destroyed by the storm. Do you think that the three of you, you know, we're going to cover a lot of ground, so we'll try and keep moving, but is it a, a moral obligation? I mean, you know the answer that we all give, particularly those of us who are now in big firms. Um, you know, I'm so busy, I just don't, don't have the time. When these kinds of things happen, is it a moral responsibility? Is that our obligation as members of the bar? Or is it just what you can afford? Or how, how do you all look at that? Well, good, good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Will Polk. Thank you so much for uh, being here. And uh, it's great to uh, be able to talk to you about uh, these issues that we all feel very passionate about. Uh, and to your question, Judge, uh, as far as it being a moral obligation, clearly it is. I mean, it, you know, we are, it does take a village to uh, respond to these events. Uh, everybody is impacted in some form or fashion, whether or not you were directly impacted, the cascading events from a disaster impact your whole community. Uh, it, it, it spills off into unemployment, it spills off into issues as far as, uh, as lawyers. Uh, you know, people had pre-existing legal issues prior to the disaster in many cases, and then once you get hit by a natural disaster, a man-made disaster, those pre-existing issues are exacerbated. And so clearly there's a, there's a moral responsibility, but also as lawyers and if you all have taken professional responsibility, even under the, and, you know, as um, the president-elect here will, can also speak to a, with the ABA, uh, rules of professional responsibility under uh, rule of uh, professional conduct 6.1. Uh, there's also the, the requirement for uh, doing pro bono service, voluntary pro bono, pro bono service, and, and utilizing your skills. You know, they don't prescribe how you do it, but there's a, in the rule there are some examples of ways that you who have been uh, worked hard and, and, and earned the opportunity to represent individuals can give back. and. Uh, not only from a moral responsibility, but also from a professional one as well. Monica, now you do this every day. Your people, this, that's what your organization does. What's the difference between what you do every day in helping low-income people right. and when one of these disasters hits? From, from your perspective, your unique perspective. Yes, so just to paint a little bit of a picture, uh, in Miami-Dade, our population is a little bit over, I want to say, I can't remember what it is now, 3 million, uh, and we have about potentially speaking, uh, the client population that Legal Services of Greater Miami serves is about 500,000 potentially eligible clients when we were just talking about people that are income eligible for our services. And so what does that mean? To paint sort of the picture about the people that we're talking that need help, uh, if you're living in poverty in the United States, that means in 2019 you're making less than, f about you're making about in the $14,000 range. So for a family of four, that's $25,000. So just to give you a picture, so the question is what's the difference? So, uh, the, the, the difference is that on the a day after a disaster, legal services has a lot more clients than it did the day before <laughs> that are eligible for our services. And I, I mean, I don't mean to be sort of funny about it, but it's, it's, it's just the Are truth. they coming to you, Monica, or do they come to the local church or they to the both. local they bar? Do so both. where do they so, come? So in, 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 in our community, we've done a lot of outreach on the fact that uh, legal services is one of the places you could go for assistance and we handle FEMA appeals. I'm sure we'll get into that a little more later. But people absolutely go to, to the local church. They go to their, sometimes the health center. They don't know where to go. They go to their friends and families. And to be honest, sometimes the legal issues that they need help with, they're not obviously legal issues. So the people don't self-identify them. So they don't know they have a legal problem. Correct, yeah. yes. So first it's identifying that there may be a legal solution to, they've already identified the problem, but they don't really understand how to sort of get over that barrier. And so recognizing that there's a legal solution to it could, you know, obviously let's, be helpful. Let's talk a little bit about how these disasters particularly impact the poor right. and the vulnerable. W what is the impact? Why is it? I alluded to a little bit in my yeah. opening remarks, but why is it that low-income people seem to be so disproportionately affected by natural disasters. And this to anyone on the panel, Monica, when you start. Because any disaster impacts uh, anyone's finances, whether you have a lot of resources or very little, and people with less money just have less financial resiliency. There's just no cushion there. 
So let's take not even a disaster. Let's take bad storm, power outage, day and a half to restore power, and all the food in my fridge and freezer go bad, and that might be $300 if I just done groceries, and then I'll be upset and get over it, clean out my fridge, and go do my groceries because I'm lucky to have the resources to go do that. But if I was in the income bracket that I just described before, I would not be able to do that. I would be uh, trying to figure out going to my local food pantry, and that's not in a disaster, right? And so, so just considering the fact that things that that many of us, I won't make assumptions about people not honest, but that many of us take for granted because they don't, they, don't, they, they don't feel like, and they are in fact not luxuries, so you just think of this as your everyday thing. People that are living in poverty cannot overcome these barriers. And so a disaster really impacts them a more a great deal. Additionally, um, if, if something happens in my home, I may try to repair it without insurance, with insurance, depending on how bad it is. But if I don't have the resources to fix the conditions in my apartment, because maybe the land, I'm not responsible for it, the landlord should be, and I don't have the resources and the, the, the owner of the property is not getting to fixing it because it's quote unquote affordable housing that he feels yeah, is, not, is not really profitable for him or her. These are the sorts of issues that it's So there's a, there's a whole broad yes. range of legal issues yeah. that come up in these kind of situations. But let me ask the three of you another issue. I think people are surprised by the long-term nature of these problems. Judy, let me, let me start with you. Are we finished with Katrina? Are people still have legal problems, believe it or not, going back to Katrina? They still do. Um, we've been able to address many of them through the great work of not only pro bono lawyers, um, both within and outside the state, and we'll talk about that as well, and the Katrina rule that came out of Katrina, but also um, the result of the tremendous work of our legal services corporation uh, funded offices, uh, Southeast Louisiana Legal Services and, and uh, Acadiana Legal Services. And what I can tell you is that we can, we, we, we map out how long certain problems have taken, um, and we learn lessons from that timeline. So after Katrina, what we realized very quickly, um, although you know your first needs are food and shelter and safety, mm -hmm. then your needs are short term or you know how do I um, have find a place to stay temporarily, and then you finally, if able to return to your house, you're thinking about how can I fix up my home, mm -hmm. how can I get my kids in a school where they were before um, when the school you know is having is struggling, or how can I hold on to my job? On the property front, what people don't realize is that. Um, when you apply for FEMA funds to restore your home, the second question, I believe, um, and it's the first or second or third question on state recovery and SBA applications, is do you own your property? And you're going to have to prove title to your property, your ownership of your property. Well, culturally, and of course, significantly in populations of poverty, that has never happened where title has been vested in the person living in the home. We also know it's culturally a challenge in 13 states in this country have significant challenges in that regard. So to answer your question about the long term, after Katrina, it took about eight years to clear the dockets of people who needed help on the property front. But mapping that and understanding it and knowing after Katrina that it wasn't the first problem they turned to, it was months later, sometimes years yeah, later, helped us ready for what happened in August 2016 in Baton Rouge when you heard about the tremendous floods that went on there. And what we were able to do was to spring into action, and we created a program, uh, the ABA Center for Innovation, working with Southeast Louisiana Legal Services, funding from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and Baton Rouge Area Bar, help from LSU Law School Law Clinic, Southern University Law Clinic, and the Baton Rouge Area Bar Association Pro Bono Project. And what we were able to do was to create an app that helps people. It's called Floodproof. It's on my phone right now. And it helps people collect the information they need about home ownership in the history of their family, and then they could do a quick conflict check. A Professor Gillers in the back of the room, she'd love that. Um, do a quick conflict check with the legal services office to see if, in fact, they can take the case. They're given a particular code, an in individual code that's sent back to them. They then consent to send their information on. If they're income eligible, they get help on establishing title to their home. Um, and if they're not income eligible or don't qualify because they're not a citizen of something else, it's referred over to the Baton Rouge uh, Bar Association and they get the help there from a pro bono project. Um, what that tells us is that that timeline has been decreased now and people are getting more help than they need. Not all of them come through the app. Some of them call a 1-800 number or call the office or visit the office directly. But understanding how lengthy this recovery process yes. is, is it, tremendous. It's not an exaggeration to say that people a decade later yeah. 
are Absolutely. still grappling with yeah. in all of these uh, so many yeah. storms and variations on the theme. Yeah. That's not uncommon. No, and I will just add one thing. It's not only people who don't have resources. It's people who are professionals. I have a brother who is a solo practitioner who he was in my family's home when Katrina hit and had nine and a half feet of water. Um, that, he moved away. He moved to Baton Rouge and had to restart a practice. So even somebody with resources to have to and their lives is turned upside down yeah. and have to start all over, it can be it's, a long time for it, people to recover. And it's hard for us on the outside to understand that. Yeah. But Will, you're an emergency manager in the broadest context. How do you prepare for these? Is there a way, particularly in relation to the legal problems that may, that may arise, how do you prepare for natural disasters and the recovery phase? Can you do it in advance? Um, you can. Uh, we, North Carolina has had, uh, I think, I guess now, three storms of record here, well, in the last 25 years. Uh, the first one was uh, Hurricane Floyd. It hit in uh, September of 1999. And, uh, and to, to uh, Judy's point, uh, still to this day, people are still, 20 years later, uh, almost 24 years later, still recovering from Hurricane Floyd with issues as it relates to that storm uh, from property issues, uh, recovery issues as far as like after they did get assistance, uh, th that, that assistance came with, I don't want, well, let's say for lack of a better term, strings attached as far as liens that were put on their property as far as getting assistance from the state government um, and other tax issues and those kind of things, getting those released. So from that storm, uh, with the two more recent storms that we've had with uh, Matthew and, and Florence, which were two back-to-back -back storms in 2016 and 2018, we, we learned a lot from, um, uh, from our experiences with Floyd and, and what worked, uh, what didn't work, uh, as far as setting up programs for disaster housing assistance and those kind of things, but it, nothing's perfect. I mean, we, we, we've stumbled, stubbed our toes uh, in, in many ways because, you know, because each storm is unique and, and the needs are unique. Some issues are very similar as far as the title issues. I mean, that's one of the bigger things that we're dealing with now. Well, but what's this idea? We hear this term coop planning. Yeah. What, what is that all about? Do, yeah. do you do that in North Carolina? We, we do. So coop planning is a continuity of operations. So uh, it's, it, it's found in many public and private institutions, uh, at least obviously uh, in the public sector, it, it flows when you think about succession planning as far as continuity of government. Uh, we also do it as far as uh, coop planning for how to reestablish an entity once it's been hit by a disaster. So some of the lessons learned from previous storms is how can we mitigate? Because that's one of the first things that you have to do at, after a storm. You look, at, you look at patterns, you look, see where the floodplains are, where the, the hot spots are, whether it's from a hurricane with flooding to when we have, uh, you know, relative winter storms in our state as far as there's certain like traffic pockets where we know that in the mountains there's saluda grade where we're going to have a track and trailer jackknife and shut down i-40 so you're looking at like how you can mitigate for future events so that's part of the cycle of emergency management that people sometimes forget everybody focuses on the, the hit you know the storm hits and we got this excellent response and you see the people get lifted off the roofs and helicopters and all that cool stuff and the swift water boats and all those kind of things. And then of course we're talking about recovery here. Well, but isn't there, isn't there also even like basic institutions like I know, 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, which is more yeah. a man-made uh, disaster obviously, the courts were closed down in right. Lower Manhattan. Right. Yeah, How so do you, can you plan for that? These basic for, fundamental you, services you, you that people can, need? You can plan for that and the great thing about our agency, so we've been tasked with that continuity planning uh, for our state government so that all the, the three branches of government each has their own continuity of operations plan. So the executive uh, has theirs. I actually drafted one for, from an agency that I worked for in the past where, you know, where if an event happens, here's what we do. Um, you know, the legislative has their continuity of plan and also the judiciary, which, uh, which they did put into action quite during, during Hurricane uh, Matthew and Florence. And, uh, you know, to deal with those issues like, you know, court's going to be shut down because the courthouse is flooded. 
And you have to you have to arraign prisoners. You have, you to, have to do lots prisoner, of things. You know, that, what, how do you do the basic functions? The basic government? functions of government. Uh, our chief justice, for example, when Florence hit, took some special steps to make sure that dealing, you know, you know, you have obviously with as a lawyer, you have filing deadlines and cases are docketed and those kind of things. So he actually, you know, sent out a directive through the administrative office of the courts on how to handle those cases and, and, and dealing with filing deadlines and those types of things. And of course, the legislative branch also will step in many times. And but, also- but, Will, I think it's a very important point yeah. for lawyers to be that yeah. you have cases, we have yeah. statute of limitations, you have right. all kinds of things going on, and yet you can't function in right. the most basic way. Right. I'm sure Judy, ABA has gotten involved in this. How do you, in each state, do you need special legislation? Can the high court issue some kind of ruling. How do you allow, putting aside all the natural tragedies that are going on, how do you allow you or some other profession to go about their business? It, it actually goes down to, the, or, uh, down to the local, the individual loyal level. You should, as a matter of ethics, be engaged in disaster planning and business continuity and looking at those risks that you have to your practice mm -hmm. either in a firm or in a, in a I was in a corporate setting for a dozen years with an aerospace and defense company we did significant disaster and in, in business continuity planning um, there's some really good guidance out of the ABA standing committee on professional ethics and professional responsibility that came out in September of this past year about what, what your ethical obligations are uh, with regard to natural disasters and other disasters that you should really take a look at. And the notion of understanding what's going to happen if you can't access your files. If your client if they're can't destroyed, find right? you, your files right, can be files destroyed. can be destroyed. And every firm in, our, in the Gulf Coast region has faced those issues and had exactly. to, to really understand and get a hold of them. And it's an important component of ethics. Um, and don't think because you're in the middle of the country that it can't happen to you. There can be something that can happen to your practice. And being ready for it is significantly important. There's a series of three webinars that are offered by the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Disaster Preparedness and Response. Um, and actually, um, last year when uh, the hurricanes hit, uh, we made those available free of charge to all legal services corporation field offices because we thought it was so important for them to have that information as well. Monica, let me ask you another question that revolves all around uh, um, not only natural disasters, but poor people and getting legal assistance. How do you create a template to connect disaster victims to legal aid and to volunteer pro bono work? How do you connect the two when you're in the middle of God knows what in the, the state or the right. immediate areas we're covering. How does that work? Well, let me talk a little bit about what happens after the disaster and then sort of because it's, it's two, different, two different ways to connect them. We've been using some terms I thought I should say. There's response and then there's recovery. Response is the immediate right after days, maybe weeks. Um, Judy was mentioning, you know, food, housing, uh, basic necessities. I would also include there sort of the immediate a uh, few days after people start if they thinking about the legal issues, it's looking at FEMA, at least our client base, looking at uh, FEMA applications, uh, emergency SNAP, also known as food stamps benefits, to address the example I had given before, because they do provide that emergency unemployment benefits. Think about if you're a server in a restaurant, your restaurant's closed, you, you can get benefits uh, while you're not earning money. So that's so sort of response, immediate legal needs. And then there's the recovery, the longer term, your, your homeowner scams, your... Right. Um, you know, long-term homeowners insurance dealing with those issues, small business owners uh, sort of trying to recover and get back to where they were. And so uh, in terms of legal responses in the, I guess, sorry for lack of a better word, in the response, what our program has done, and, and a lot of legal services offices around the country, in the immediate, you want volume. You want to get information out. Uh, I mean, normally people don't know necessarily the ins and outs of filing a FEMA application, which is a good thing. We don't, you know, we don't want to get to the place where people uh, really know that too well, um, just because of what it would mean. But we do, I would say, at, Irma hit us in 2017. 
really it devastated Monroe County, which is the Florida Keys. It also hit Miami-Dade, but to give you some perspective, Monroe County got it as a category five, we got it as a category one or two, depending on where you were in Miami-Dade, so significant difference. Uh, but we, in the immediate aftermath of Irma, both in Miami-Dade and Monroe, we did clinics where we just said, and we partnered, you're right, people don't know necessarily to come to us, but you know who they go to? They're local elected officials, state reps, county commissioners, city officials, so we partnered with them, and we said, you blast it out, you get it information to the community, and we'll staff it with volunteers and our staff, and we saw 800 people in clinics in a matter of, I wanna say two weeks or three weeks, it was, it was, it was busy. <laughs> and so that was giving people legal information and some advice sometimes on how to fill out a FEMA application so that you don't end up with a legal problem. The best, the, the best thing a lawyer could do, right, is avoid the legal problem. So helping them fill out the application, um, avoid pitfalls, that sort of thing. And for that situation, how we connect the volunteers was very easy. Um, sort of, you get, the, you get the attorneys to the clinics. Now getting the attorneys to clinics when there's you know, like very little cell reception, no electricity was a little challenging, but, but we did it. And then sort of in the weeks after when, when business is sort of returning back to usual to the extent possible and businesses are operating, we have, and many local legal services programs, if not all, have uh, pro bono coordinators that, and so do some law firms that work yeah, with- Yeah, but, but let me ask you a question and, and the rest yeah. of the panel too. You know, you get corporate lawyers or lawyers who do deals, you know, financial right. deals, whatever they all do, they want to be helpful. How do you train lawyers? Does the ABA provide training? Do you as legal services provide training? Will do the manager? What do you do with people who want to be helpful, but they're not necessarily in that area of the law that we're dealing with? Can you train people out of their normal comfort zone? Yeah, so, so Absolutely, one given is that the most experienced people for natural disasters in terms of legal services to be rendered is the full-time legal services staff of legal services uh, funded offices across They're the trained. country. But what about the Extraordinary other? trained. Um, <laughs> but we need more help, and they readily recognize they welcome the help. They are extraordinarily wonderful about partnering and collaborating. Mm -hmm. um, the ABA Young Lawyers Division mm -hmm. um, holds for over three decades um, a contract, a memorandum of understanding with FEMA, and they are the first in uh, source of pro bono legal services in the country for federally declared natural disasters. Um, so as a consequence, they have a whole, judge a whole structure set up across the country with regional directors ahead at the national level, uh, a lead person, and then it, it deploys like a decision, like a, a phone tree almost, that they have help all over the ground, all over the country. And it extends to Guam and the Marianas and all the territories. And what they do is assess and work very closely with the local legal services corporation offices, funded offices. They assess what the needs are. Um, they do that in a very, very um, thoughtful and, and, and uh, strategic way. And then they deploy the resources. And those resources can either be local lawyers who want to help, not just young lawyers, but many are young lawyers. So it's a wonderful way for all of you to engage when you do have a license and start practicing. Um, but they also bring in senior lawyers and right. other lawyers, corporate lawyers. The way you train them is that you hold training sessions m most often with help from legal services offices and people who have been on yeah, the ground know before. How to do, but let me ask you all another question that we've all seen in these natural disasters. You know, you have out-of-state attorneys who want to come in and be helpful. And yet you have an established bar in a state that's working very hard to deal with the disaster. You have legal practice rules as to what you can do and what you can't do. You have, to be honest, a little parochialism among lawyers. The gee, we've got it under control. What do you all want to do and you know, come in? You don't even know our, our state. Is that a real problem? I know we've seen it in so many of these disasters. Have you had that in Florida, Molly? Um. Have Where lawyers people, come in and everyone says, well, what are you doing here? We got it. Don't bother well, us. Florida has not, um, I, I mean, I, I should let Judy speak to it, but there's the, the Katrina rule in Louisiana, I, I guess, and they recently in Texas, Texas I think. Texas and North Carolina. Carolina. And North Carolina. You need a special rule? Is that yes. what it is? To yes, do I'm what, sorry. Money? What is to the be rule able do? to provide legal assistance in that state, even, even if, though you're even not if, practicing, even though you're not an admitted lawyer. Because if you're, you're not an admitted lawyer, yeah. right, because you are not an admitted lawyer, even if your services are free. So if you're thinking, well, I'm just providing a free legal service, I want to help people, um, it would still be considered the unauthorized practice of law in Florida today. 
So, so what happened is after Katrina, um, there was an extraordinary need for out of uh, for, for more pro bono services because the entire legal community was devastated, not only at their homes but at their offices too. And so uh, folks from all around the country wanted to help, and there was some reticence, some lack of mm -hmm. understanding, and some concerns about consumer harm that may come if somebody was coming in and practicing in my good civilian law state. Um, and as a consequence, it took quite a while, mo almost 18 months, I believe it was, before a Katrina rule was put in place. And that rule says for a, an extended period of time, typically six months, and it can be extended for another six or so, the Supreme Court issues an order that says out-of-state attorneys who are in good standing in their state and jurisdiction can come in and practice for no fee on a pro bono basis to help victims of disasters. There's typically been some variations of that, where in the first um, iterations of the Katrina rule, it was for people at certain poverty, below certain poverty levels. Then and that was lifted in some states and it became people who were subject to, had been victims of natural disasters. Most remarkably, Texas and uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Nathan Heck, after the um, floods there, and uh, the hurricanes there. He issued an order um, after consultation with the ABA and others that said that those lawyers who want to help pro bono can also do it remotely. So lawyers sitting in your great state were able to help remotely when at their, you know, their desktop computers or their laptops at night and they could help. Um, and they just had to file a form with the state of Texas, Supreme, with the Supreme Court, and it was really of significant help that people came out in thousands to help. Yeah, to get rid of the red tape, to let them help. Yes, right? yes. The people yeah. just want right. to serve will, yeah? Right, and also the second to the emergency management aspect of it is too, there's the emergency management assistance compact. Uh, I don't know if mm -hmm. it's called EMAC. And uh, basically, whenever there's a state of emergency declared in a state that has had a disaster or an event, EMAC can be triggered so that you can use, it's a cross, basically it's a, it's a, a cross-border mutual aid agreement uh, established by Congress in the mid-90s. Uh, all states and the territories are signatories to it. And under that, there are uh, protections for professional services where that uh, if out-of-state lawyers, and I know we use this in North Carolina with, uh, with the medical society, uh, we spent months working with them prior to, prior to the storm, but, and I know they did this, this in Texas as well, uh, out-of-state medical professionals and other, profes other licensed professions were able to, uh, we were able to bring them in working with other states who uh, were responding, helping us to respond to our event uh, through the EMAC system so that one, uh, we could keep, you know, one, it was mutually beneficial because we knew who was coming into our state as far as, you know, doing this work. The licensed profession, <coughs> profession uh, associate uh, organization also knew who was coming in so that there were any issues we could keep track of those individuals who were coming into our state to assist us with those uh, with 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 Hurricane Florence so uh, so in addition to the rules that you know that uh, Chief Justice can sometimes suspend rules as far as rules of practice and those kind of things uh, there's also the EMAC system that can be utilized by emergency management to shift resources around you know typically people think of you know materials, but it can also be used for people. Well, let me ask you a variation on, on, on what we've been talking about. There's so many players involved here, and we touched on some of them. How do you achieve the partnerships that you need between the emergency responders, the emergency management folks, legal aid entities, uh, pro bono volunteers, the organized bar, government, nonprofits, how do you fit this together in a seamless way? Can that be done, Monica? Uh, before the disaster. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it can't be done after. It's a problem, I right? mean, I mean, I'm sure it could be done. But if you're saying how to do it, if we're having a panel discussion on how to do things properly uh, before the disaster. Uh, so as part of our COOP this year, um, we've always had a continuity of operations plan, but we actually integrated sort of our community agencies that we work with on a regular basis and we're setting up meetings, a community meeting with them so that we can share our, our coop with them and they can share theirs with us so that when a disaster hits, we're to the so extent So everyone's, the, the idea page. is everyone's talking to each other yes. before the disaster hits. But let me ask you a specific question on that. Um, legal services, legal assistance, lawyers are not necessarily the first thing that emergency managers or responders 
are thinking about. I remember, again, using an analogy, and by Sandy, we had figured it out. But when we had 9-11 in New York, we begged the mayor's people and the governor's people to give us the seat at the table when they were meeting every day to try and figure out the latest, you know, what we're going to try and restore today, tomorrow, the other day. So is it the, still the case that legal assistance is not necessarily the first thing that comes to mind um, in, the, in organizing these kinds of uh, uh, interagency or intergovernmental uh, uh, forums where people talk to each other? Do they get it today? Does everyone get it? Will, let me start with you. Do emergency managers get it that legal Maybe. assistance is a vital part of this program? I, I Are you talking to the ABA or to yeah. the local bar or to the legal service provider? I, I believe so. Uh, I think, I know at least in our state and also just in my work uh, when I was uh, chair of the Legal Counsel Committee for NEMA, uh, it's the, NEMA is the National Emergency Management Association. It's made up of all the uh, EM work uh, organizations and we do have a Legal Counsel Committee and access to justice is one of the things that uh, we've talked about in, in, in the past. And so I think for emergency managers, not only for their immediate issues uh, with their agencies, I think they know, but I think, I think one thing that's important is, I know many times uh, we have what's called emergency operation plans, and that's sort of the Bible for how you deal with various things, various events. And, you know, and legal services may be mentioned in there, but I think it's important to bring those people in when we have our, ex our, our exercises on different topics, uh, our statewide exercise on hurricane recovery or, or whatever, so that one, we know what their, cap their capacity is. Also, they know what our role in the process as far as responding to the event in the short-term recovery and the long-term recovery. And, and one of the things that we have in our state is a, establish a standing disaster recovery task force so that uh, sunny day, we, all the response agencies um, and recovery agencies we, we get together and we talk regularly. Well, but, it, but in relation to the law and the legal side, yeah. it's not just for the exercise, right? We right. really are an important part of that you puzzle. You are a very important part of the process. And also, I think another thing that I think would be very helpful this long term is not wait until there's a federal, federally declared event, because the vast majority of events are going to be those small local emergent disasters that will never get CNN in your neighborhood. Um, and so I think it's very important at, whenever those things happen is, is for when uh, the local emergency management community to really build those networks. Uh, hopefully they've done it before the event, but also understanding there's still a role because many states and local governments also have disaster recovery programs. I know we do in North Carolina. And so they, uh, the issues of title and other things come up in, in our state declared events, just like they do in the federal, big federal declared events. So it, it's very important, I think, you know, to, you know, all, to use a mantra, I think, from uh, former uh, FEMA director Craig Fugate, all disasters begin in, in locally. Yeah, but, and but, so I think it's very important to make sure at, to, to really pull the local emergency managers, the state emergency managers, to really pull in their legal services offices to help with those events as well. Bill, uh, Bill, uh, Will, but building on what you're saying about it's all really local, it starts at the local level, there are uh, uh, parts of the puzzle that I think normally we wouldn't associate it. What about business? Mm -hmm. Is business important in these kinds of efforts? Do you, Monica, do you deal with businesses and the disaster relief, or are they doing their own thing, trying to recover their own, uh, you know, operating efficiency or... Right, so we actually represent some client, we represent a significant amount of small businesses for financially eligible clients. So actually one really interesting part of recovery for them is very important, right? You think, think barber shops, small family restaurants, and sort of their recovery and providing, providing prep before, for us in South Florida's hurricane season, before hurricane season, making sure they have all the, the right documentation, insurance, contracts, and sort of that situation in place. But then our big businesses, that's interesting. We in the, in the past have not partnered with like big box stores and that sort of thing in, in terms of our recovery and, and response. And Judge, I think Judy, no yeah. matter the size of the business, they have to be, they're integral to the preparation yeah. and also response. Yeah. I can tell you that the SBA, I think, puts out some data that 
uh, when that, a natural disaster hits um, of a magnitude of a federally declared disaster, certainly, only one in four small businesses are going to survive. Think about that. And think about yeah. what, how much of an, a part of the engine of your local community they are. Um, when Katrina hit, I was um, in the aerospace and defense industry, and two of the, we own three of the five uh, uh, largest shipyards in the country, and two of the five were hit by Katrina. Um, and in each of those states, Louisiana and Mississippi, that was the largest private employer in the state. So think about not only the insurance claim, which at the time um, that I was managing was, I think, the largest private insurance claim for a natural disaster at the time, but more importantly, getting the job of that business was getting, you know, 15, 22,000, whatever the numbers were, of employees in a state back to work. Because if those employees in a state don't go back to work, yeah, then exactly. what happens exactly is right. their children don't have food in their mm -hmm. table and their children can't stay in the schools. And, you know, it's just a ripple effect that happens. So you've got to understand that the businesses are critical partners because they're not only looking at it from the loss of revenue that they're experiencing as a result of the natural disaster. They're looking at it as the possible result being that they're losing talent among their workforce that will move and go somewhere else if the community does not come back promptly, if the schools aren't reopened, if the hospitals aren't available. Exactly. So you've got to work with them in collaboration and partnership, not only for the corporate mission, but hopefully part of that corporate mission is helping employees be the, 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 um, the breadwinners that they can for the families. Um, yeah. the let, me, let me also mention another community that you wouldn't normally associate with this kind of thing, the faith community. People often come to their local a church, temple, synagogue, whatever, mosque, people come because they don't know what to do and they don't know where else to go. So the faith community has to be plugged in to whether it's the legal services or the local bar or the emergency manager, all very important. But let, let me get one other thing while we're talking about uh, coordination, making all work together. It often seems like the state, the city, and the federal government are sometimes going in different directions. Will, is that, is that what happens? Is, is, it, is it a competition? Who's the hero? The mayor gets up or the governor gets up or the president comes to town? Is it, is it a smooth, well-oiled machine or is it a competition for who's solving the disaster and really no one is? Go ahead. Well, I can only speak for North Carolina, but uh, we have had a tremendously, um, tremendous partnership with both our local and our federal partners. Uh, we actually um, were one of, actually we were the first uh, pilot state for uh, FEMA uh, to uh, establish what they call their FIT teams, which basically uh, some of the lessons they learned from, uh, well, one, one thing, since I mean, we're, we're called FEMA Region 4, so our regions are re collectively, are, we're all in Region 4, in Region 5. But uh, our regions get hit a lot, so we have, you know, we've, we've been through this, through this a, a bit. We're veterans of this. So uh, whenever storms come, FEMA's always been, at least in my experience, forward-leaning uh, to get it, get stood up to be ready for the after effects of an event. But uh, in addition to that, uh, the uh, FEMA set up what they call a fit team, and it's basically it's key components of. of the, or, the uh, members who are uh, embedded with our state emergency management agency. So they're there day to day with us, working with us, understanding those kind of things. So I can say over without a doubt that uh, it's been my experience and I've been doing this work since uh, since uh, 2008. Uh, it's been, uh, been, been a partnership. Uh, well, nobody's worried about turf and, and those kind of things. Now, obviously, whenever things happen, you know, there's going to be disagreements, and, and especially when you get to the long-term recovery, just trying to determine what things are eligible expenses and what things are not eligible. This, you know, I'm getting down into the weeds, but, um, you know, we just work, we work through those things, and sometimes things can be reimbursed under the Stafford Act, and sometimes they can't. But. You know what, but Will, in, this, in uh, talking about the different levels of government, the thing that we all see, if you're not intimately involved in this in every day, well, you're, the, it, it, there, is part, there are partnerships at the local and, and the city and state level. But you know, we all see the, in, on the news the federal government. Right. 
How do you get the federal government's attention, particularly when it involves legal issues? You know, right. you see all the back and forth. Look at Puerto Rico. Right. How do we, whose job is that? Judy, well, is it the ABA? Is it the Legal Services Corporation? Is it the legal service entities? Who's getting the attention of the policymakers in Washington where the big bucks are mm -hmm. to help the locality when you have one of these terrible events? So the ABA acts through its House of Delegates, which is its policymaking body, about 560 members elected from across the country. So we certainly have policy um, that uh, allows us to speak to issues of the necessary funding, um, the need for more funding in the disaster legal services arena, um, and also to support the good work um, of the Legal Services Corporation in our country. Um, the ABA has something every year called ABA Day in the Hill. We bring together about 400 leaders from state and local and affinity bars across the country, and you visit your congressional delegation. So um, maybe eight or ten of us from my state of Louisiana or six or seven in another year, but the bar leaders, the, the state bar presidents, along, as well as the ABA leaders, go to each member of the congressional delegation. In my case, we're very fortunate with Louisiana. Most of the time, it's the congressional member, him or herself, that meets with us in a small group talking about critical issues of importance. The number one priority each and every year is adequate funding for Legal Services Corporation. We may be addressing VAWA, we may be addressing gun violence in another year or something else, whatever the priorities of the association are. Or you but could we be discussing. always talk about funding that is necessary yeah, right. for natural disasters and for Legal Services yeah. Corporation to do its work. It is critical. No, right. that's how I was going to ask you. Yeah. You would bring an issue like that yes. up with the congressional delegation and yes. say, look, we're dying here, whether it's three years after Katrina or some other place in the country. That's a logical thing to bring right. up. Right. And, and we actually tell them about specific narratives of individual constituents that have been helped by the Legal Services Corporation, mm -hmm. uh, Legal Services Delivered, as well as the pro bono work that Legal Services is by constitution and charter required to engage in. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah, and uh, through, the, the, through NEMA, there is the, through the Legal Counsel Committee, uh, whenever we have our annual form, we always have at least one at the annual form in March and, or April in, in DC. And as part of that, and even at our spring, at the, uh, at the uh, second meeting during the year, FEMA's Office of uh, Chief Counsel, their, their general counsel for the agency actually comes and uh, sits at the table with us, Adrian, and um, he uh, hears from us as far as the issues and concerns that we have as, um, as state's attorneys for, uh, for emergency management, some of the issues that we have as far as appeals, uh, right. You know anything under the sun that you know that you highlight we, those, we highlight those it and bring it up to the level of the office of chief counsel and of course you know obviously as a lawyer you advise the policymakers but it's good to have that ear of the the chief legal Absolutely. executive of FEMA to hear directly from the states and he's and we also have conference calls throughout the year whenever things are pending on the hill for example with the most recent disaster relief legislation our organization, we chimed in yeah. on some of the uh, reforms that was in the Disaster Reform okay. Act of last year. And uh, also like the ABA, we also, whenever we're in DC, we do have those Hill visits. So each individual state emergency manager meets with their delegation and um, usually their lawyers are with them to talk about those issues. Okay, a couple of more quick issues and then we'll have any questions that you might have. Just more on that sub uh, subject, Monica. This Florida with all the storms you've had in the recent time, do you get the attention of the funders? Are you getting the resources that you need to uh, recover? Uh, I will say that after Irma, we had a lot of foundations uh, just literally contacting us and saying, what do you need? And we were putting proposals but together. But not necessarily the government. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I'm assuming those funds went elsewhere, but that's okay. So, uh, Is it to some degree a political issue, even the red states, blue states? Is that where the monies go, depending on who's it? Or does that really not matter? Or, or, or are you too busy working to recover to, to get into those political issues? <laughs> You're going to get me into trouble here, Judge. Um, so <laughs> I, I'll say well, I'll go with the latter. I'm too busy working yeah. <laughs> these issues. Okay. Um, let me, let me get one or two quick questions before we go to your yeah. questions. Um, you've each been involved in disasters. What was the most um, telling thing you've been involved with? Is there one quick little story of a success 
that you can say coming out of disaster recovery and legal assistance? Monica, let me start with you. Um, I'll talk about one success and just one challenge that really yeah, paints the quickly, picture. Yeah, quickly, we want to get quickly. to that question. Go Monroe ahead. County is, has, even before storm, had major affordable housing issues, meaning they had, it had none. Um, and so, well, not enough, I should say, not enough. Um, and so their workforce, Monroe, you know, the keys, tourism, you know, your housekeepers, your waitresses could not, had difficulty finding housing. And so after the storm, that's just gotten worse. Uh, to the point that I think in a couple of instances, hotels are helping to provide uh, affordable housing for some of their workers. That's generous and great, not really a long-term solution for the community itself because then you, you have clearly an unmet need. Uh, one quick success story. This is very Salt Life, Monroe County. I love it. Just it, We just got a notice of this win, I think, last week. Um, uh, one of our clients that lived on a very, very modest houseboat uh, put in for FEMA assistance, because as you can imagine, during Irma was completely destroyed, like down to splinters, and um, got, I'm gonna, I think it was between two or $3,000 award on initially. Um, clearly, uh, it was a houseboat. I mean, however modest it was, that would not be enough to get them a new one or a down payment or anything. And after a much back and forth uh, with FEMA, uh, they just got an award uh, for the maximum of $34,000. Uh, so they're now on a new, not a new, a new houseboat for them. Uh, so they're able to move on. And that's just an example that they're able right. to on keep one the small life, scale. Yeah. Yeah. Very small scale. To able to go back to the life that they recovery in a yeah. sense for them. Yeah. Will quickly go ahead. Uh, quick, just a, uh, to be determined if it's going to be a success story, but it's, but it's looking uh, very promising. Uh, with Florence, we've uh, implemented the, uh, the step program, which uh, has a, uh, so basically a program that does short-term repairs for people's uh, damaged homes. And it's been done here in New York, it's been done in Louisiana, a couple other, Florida, a couple other places. So uh, we have, uh, we, this is our first time implementing it and uh, had some hiccups along the way, which is, goes to my, my challenges next. But, uh, but I feel very confident that we're gonna have some good results from that. I did hear uh, somehow, a phone call. Usually, I don't talk directly with uh, disaster recipients, but one day at the office, a call did make its way back to me, and uh, it was a woman who had been impacted by Florence, and she enrolled in a program, and uh, we had utilized some of our VOADs to to help um, with her home, and she was very very excited that we were able to get that short term repair for her, uh, you know, given that it's the winter time and those kind of things. So that's. That was one of those moments where I was like, it was after a very frustrating day with my challenge with this program, which is, uh, you know, implementing new programs and, and learning all the rules. And you can still be an experienced attorney and sometimes, you know, make mistakes and, uh, you know, because there's a sure volume of stuff that comes through um, when you're dealing with the disaster. So, uh, you know, also, you know, that's some of the challenges of it in that it's just a sheer volume and just trying to make your way through all the all the bureaucracy and red tape and the rules uh so you know that's what we're here for but it you know um it, it can be frustrating at times but it was nice to ha hear from that lady that day judy uh four quick data points the flood proof program i told you about not just the certainly the app was a small tool but the whole program um 337 households were helped they represent uh 727 individuals below the federal poverty guideline level um, it returned a um, $8.75 million economic benefit to the state, um, and that meant on average $59,000 to each of those uh, individuals who were helped. Um, and that's just with help delivered from the Legal Services Corporation and pro bono, pro bono attorneys, um, helping them establish title to their property, their home that they had lived in, which helped them get SBA funds, state recovery funds, and FEMA funds. Great questions. Thank you, panel for that fascinating discussion. Now let's see what we could do with this panel out in the audience. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Hi, thanks for coming. I was wondering if there's been any engagement with the government prosecution community in discussing how they should or should not adjust their discretionary power to charge individuals in light of the circumstances of a natural disaster. Good question. Um, I see everyone's well, jumping to answer that very well, easy question. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, I, as far as with the DA, with our district attorneys, um, 
We, I haven't had any personally. I do know uh, where we have had situations where we have had discussions is on the back end where people are committing fraud. <laughs> uh, we just recently had a case that was prosecuted in our Eastern District of North Carolina where a person committed uh, fraud uh, to get, receive disaster services. But uh, that's, that's a very good idea, and I'm gonna def definitely take that forward. I mean, well, there are, I mean, I'll say it was more prosecution. I mean, there is some things as far as like driver's license where we've done special legislation to give more people time to um, get, you know, get the license renewed and those kind of things so they wouldn't get a uh, driver while license revoked or any kind of criminal charge or things like that. So there has been efforts like that to um, help people uh, so they don't inadvertently break the law, but I um, uh, haven't had any direct experience talking with DAs. Um, just a case study that you should look at um, is the post-Katrina Danzinger 7 case, um, which involved uh, uh, actions by police that resulted in criminal charges and convictions and what flowed from that. Um, and those questions are really tough ones, and I think you have to take every community as a unique community and um, look at what the history is there and also what the circumstances of the disaster is. So I don't think it's an easy template. Um, but I think that's the kind of very, the, those are the very kinds of conversations that have to happen pre-disaster in order that people can at least have um, those critical and very hard-driven conversations post-disaster real time. But they have at least the foundational relationships between PDs and prosecutors and others who are interested stakeholders to allow them to have the difficult conversations later on. Great. Other questions? Can I just say one thing? Oh, Monica, sorry. of course. Oh, does somebody have a question? No. No, um, go ahead. You started off by asking if it was a moral obligation. Uh, and I think the easy answer is sort of yes. But I would be remiss in a room full of, of law students to not say this, that volunteer, sort of we're all busy people. And to the extent that you could help people, I always ask myself, like, what's my highest and best use? And as attorneys, you're going to be licensed, fingers crossed. Um, and um, your highest and best use, not always, but sometimes, is going to be helping out somebody with a legal problem. And so I venture to say that Miami-Dade is unique in terms of the level of income inequality compared to some communities, but it is not unique in the growing income inequality. And I will tell you that for any community to have 20% of its citizens feel that they don't have access to justice or that their needs are not being met are not good for the community in which you live, in which your children or you will learn or in which you work. And so I think it's an investment in your community to go out and help people with pro bono legal services, especially after disaster because people feel most vulnerable. And sometimes you don't always resolve their legal issue, but if you could answer questions and put people in a position where they feel less desperate and they feel like they've been treated with dignity, you're making a huge impact on somebody's life and I promise you're doing something good in the long run for your community because I think as you said, the ripple effect that happens is incredible. But, but you know, isn't that really the point that this is all about what lawyers are supposed to be doing mm -hmm. and it's nice to have two cars in the garage or three or whatever mm -hmm. it is, but the lawyers are supposed to help people and serve others. That's what being a lawyer is about, and I think we all feel that from our different perspectives. I think Judy particularly from the organized bar. Um, we try to emphasize all the time that this is not something about feathering our own nests. It's about helping people, and I think in this realm of natural disasters, it comes to the front almost more than in any other situations. People, as Monica just said, are desperate. Judy? Um, you will obviously not walk away if you help somebody with a fee. <laughs> you obviously will put in a lot of hard work at a difficult time. It may be a difficult time in your life otherwise with lots of burdens on you. But as somebody who has been the recipient of extraordinary acts of kindness from somebody sending me single white sheets where there weren't single white sheets to be found because the Red Cross shelters take them all, and I was trying to give bedding to my kids in a temporary home in Baton Rouge, um, to somebody who received help in so many other ways for family members who needed legal help, um, I can tell you that you will forever have the gratitude of those that you helped, and you can take that with you for the rest of your life as a lawyer. Okay, so thank you. Okay, thank all of you for being here, and again, I wanna thank the panel. For <laughs>